I didn't really enjoy running the team for the last three years that I was doing it, but I loved walking into a room and telling other real estate agents that I ran a team because it was almost like it elevated me to this level, right? Like I'm talking to you from up here and you're a little bit down here because I run a team and it was really just sucking my life out of me. Awesome. Welcome, Sean. Glad to have you. Hey, thanks for having me, Kayla. I've been a big fan. I've been watching you guys for a while and I feel pretty honored to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. Well, I've been a, a big fan of your journey and loving all of your content. Uh, you have a couple podcasts and just absolutely loving the value that you're bringing the real estate community. But let's like kind of take a step back. And I'd love for you to introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about your real estate journey. Yeah, let's see. So my name is Sean Nealon. I'm a real estate agent out of Denver. And I've been an agent now about seven and a half years. And I got in after a five or six year career as a regional sales rep in the credit repair industry. So that that kind of prepped me for the real estate industry in a lot of different ways. I was a regional manager. I managed seven states at my pinnacle. And I was mostly working with realtors and mortgage lenders. During that journey, I mean, I learned so much about credit and how it works and helping people get their credit scores up into a spot to qualify for mortgages. But I learned so much about how real estate transactions work. And all my people, like all my friends, all of my um, business partners were in the industry too. So I feel like when I decided to take that turn into real estate, actually I flipped a coin. And I always say that it, maybe it landed on the wrong side of the coin until, until recently, like these last year or so. Um, I flipped a coin whether I was gonna go into real estate or mortgage and it landed on heads, which meant real estate. So dove into real estate and I kind of just took everything that I learned, um, not only from other agents and how they were doing business, but also from like the regional manager side and how I went about getting business. So I started off really hot. I think my first year I, I closed 17 transactions. Um, I missed rookie of the year by like $4,000 GCI. And I'll never forget, it. I, I, I sold my own house and I didn't take a commission and Neil Donovan ended up beating me by four grand. So I've always kind of had it out for Neil, but he's a really good guy, so I couldn't lose to a better guy. Um, I'm still a little bitter about that seven years later, if you couldn't tell. It sounds like <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> no, so so that was really good. Um, the next year, I started a team with a good buddy of mine, Jaden Hansen. We started a team at uh, a small local brokerage that we were at. We quickly grew in about five or six months to over 20 agents, and a lot of them were really new agents. And we thought we had this business model that was ironclad that would kind of keep us pretty hands off. But um, you've ran teams, you've ran brokerages, you know that that's never the case. Uh, we ended up getting really overwhelmed, um, ended up kind of taking half of the team, the team, the half of the team that was producing. And we went over to Compass and spent the next couple years over there. And then about a year and a half ago, um, after growing that team, we, we ended up, you know, in 2020, 2021, being one of the top five teams in Denver, um, over 100 million in volume. Our average agent was doing about eight and a half million dollars worth of volume. So pretty good production out of a out of a team there. And about a year and a half ago, I joined Real Brokerage, split off from the team model, and I've been riding solo for for most of that journey. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, and I did see the progression. I saw when you joined Real, and and I was excited for you. I I love what Real's doing, and love everything about um, them, their leadership. So I was really excited for you. But that's a big decision. So let's talk a little bit about that because I think that we start off in real estate and we think, okay, we want to, you know, create a team or open a brokerage and we want to do these big things and we want to help other agents be successful. And you, you did that. You, you had that journey and very successful. Like, wow, congrats on all that you were able to accomplish. But then you made a decision to go back solo. And so I, I kind of like want to get inside your head there and figure out like what was going on and what made you decide to go back into solo production? Yeah. So that's, that's kind of a long, complicated answer because it was something that I <laughs> fought with for a really long time, actually. There were a lot of aspects that I really loved about running a team. Um, I think I'm a natural leader. I can lead people pretty well. And I also have a real knack for helping people. And it's, it's one of those things where... I think I got caught up in the fast pace culture of the business, especially through the years of like 18 through 21, where, I mean, it was, it was lights out, like so many deals going on. Team was really busy. 
I have an ADHD brain. So when I'm constantly being pulled in a million different directions, I actually thrive a little bit. Um, what I wasn't able to really pick up on and grasp was my situation at home and how that was impacting things at home. So I'm a single dad. I've got three kids. I got three little boys, ages two, four, and five. And, um, you know, when me and my ex were together, that was at the pinnacle of my real estate career. And that was like everything I was going for. And I kept tricking myself to say that, like, listen, I'm going out and I'm, I'm hustling, I'm crushing, I'm doing all these deals to provide a good life for the family. And we did, like we had, we had a really good life and I was able to set it up in a way to where I would leverage my team quite a bit. So during the weekends, I wasn't out showing property. I'm not doing open houses. I've got team members kind of handling all of those pieces, but it didn't relieve any of the stress of the deals. I mean, when, you, when you've got a dozen deals going on at once that are, that are your own, and then you've got, you know, a dozen more team members that have deals going on, your phone's blowing up constantly. You're never really present in the room I remember just the smallest thing would just derail me. And if you go back and you ask my kids, and, and it's probably my oldest son is probably the only one that remembers at this point. But if you go back and ask him if dad was really like a fun guy, if he really enjoyed being around me, I bet the answer is no, because I was just always teetering on the edge of just frustration or anger and just so much stress going on. So I took a real hard look at it and I kind of pieced together the reasons why I liked having a team. And I also looked at, okay, what is my ROI on my solo production? What's my dollar per hour on my team production? And it was so overwhelmingly in favor of my own production that I was actually losing money by, by running a team. For every dollar I was making running the team, I was making seven or $8 on my own production. So there's like a seven or eight X return there. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to dedicate a lot of hours. So that's the business side of it. But if I'm really honest, I didn't really enjoy being pulled in that many directions. I didn't enjoy all of the, I mean, and you know, uh, some agents are super motivated. They're going to go out, they're going to do what they're going to do. And you can coach them on a piece and they're going to go out and do it. That's a very rare agent. A lot of them, they're going to want to suck a lot of time. They're going to want to get a lot of value out of it, but then they don't go and apply it. And that for me was really hard and they skip brokerages and it's like, that was really frustrating for me. But then I got really deep into it and started thinking, okay, well, how does this serve my ego? And really what it boiled down to, I didn't really enjoy running the team for the last three years that I was doing it. But I loved walking into a room and telling other real estate agents that I ran a team because it was almost like it elevated me to this level, right? Like I'm talking to you from up here and you're a little bit down here because I run a team. But ultimately it wasn't a profitable team for me and it was really just sucking my life out of me. I, I mean, the, the self-awareness there, we're, we're, you know, we're layers deep in that because you mentioned a few things. But I love that you were able to come to that conclusion that, hey, is, what, what's this really doing for me? And realize that maybe it was an ego thing and ROI wasn't there. So you made that shift. And, and you know, I, I agree. In fact, I look at kind of the future of real estate and how everything is changing and how brokers and team leaders are operating on such a razor thin profit margin, yet shouldering all of the legal, financial, all of the responsibilities. And I wonder often, is this sustainable, right? Like, is it sustainable for the future of real estate for compensation models even, right? So I think there's a lot there, but I'm, you know, kind of really interested in once you pivoted back into solo production, I want to know what your key pillars are for lead generating. Cause I think that our listeners are going to love to hear this. Um, you know, you operate, you're very successful. So what are the things that you do like rain or shine to lead generate? Yeah. So my bread and butter has always been referral. So I work strictly by referral. And this is where I was saying earlier, where I took a lot of the aspects that I learned as a regional sales manager for the credit repair company, and I applied it to the real estate industry. So the very first trip, I remember I went to Boise, Idaho for my very first credit repair trip. And I had set up 12 meetings with 12 different loan officers. And I was going to go out there and give my little presentation and hopefully get a lot of business from it. Right. So I go out there and I remember meeting the first person and I set up my little laptop on their desk and I'm going through this pie chart and it was just, it was grueling for me. I know it was grueling for them. 
after that, I was questioning like, oh my goodness, what did I, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing in this industry? Now I'm in Boise, Idaho, so far away from everything, but I'm going to keep giving it my shot. Probably about Wednesday of that week, I just, I ditched the computer. I ditched the whole presentation. I just started talking to people real, just getting in relationship with them, talking to them about their kids, talking to them about their life, what are their hobbies? And that started working. Immediately, this loan officer is like, hey, I want you to come meet my branch manager. And I'm thinking like, well, what in the world is a branch manager? I mean, that sounds pretty cool. Goes and introduced me to this branch manager, and I'm sitting there BSing with this guy, and he's like, hey, can you come back in a couple weeks and talk at our team meeting? I want everybody to meet you. Because like, we, we really need your, your service here. And then it hit me. Okay, I can go and set 12 appointments with 12 people, 12 individual loan officers, or I can go straight to these branch managers and see all 12 people in one meeting, right? Like time is money. So I'd rather leverage my time. And that's really the approach I've taken into real estate sales. So as soon as I got in, I started working with as many business professionals as I could. And I tried to target business professionals that I know come into contact with people who could be in a position to buy or sell houses. So you've got a lot of insurance agents, you've got a lot of financial advisors. Um, one of the best, um, referral pro, uh, excuse me, referral partners I've ever had have been attorneys. I work with a ton of probate and estate attorneys, people who pass away. They're often dealing with a house full of stuff and a family member who maybe lives out of state, um, or just may maybe they don't have the mental capacity to go through an entire estate, sell a property, hold an estate sale, um, get rid of all the junk that's left over, do any renovations that need to happen. Like people don't have the capacity after suffering such a loss. So I've really filled a good position in there to where I can go through and work with a lot of these different estate attorneys and provide a lot of value to their clients and the, the beneficiaries of these estates to help them get um, the house set up. So a lot of networking. Um, I try to provide as much value as I can. So, so if I'm going to meet with a business professional, the entire meeting is predicated on how can I help you? Like if I can provide you a lot of value, Kayla, and that, that grows your business, I mean, you're not going to be indebted to me necessarily, but you're going to be a lot more likely to refer somebody to me if I'm, help, if I'm able to help you substantially grow your business. And that's just always the approach I've taken. Yeah, I like it. It's that law of reciprocity. And when you give something of value, be it your time, your attention, something that's going to be useful for them, um, there's almost that like just natural byproduct is, is they're going to give something back to you to kind of, you know, pay you for that value in a sense. So definitely love that. Uh, is there anything, any, anything strategic that you do to get into relationship with these business professionals? So you mentioned financial planners, insurance agents, attorneys, um, anything strategic that you've done or that you continue to do to meet these individuals or foster those relationships? Yeah. So <clears throat> I always try to be the connector in, 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 in my group. So I think, and this is, this is kind of the million dollar question that's really elevated my real estate career. And it always comes at like the end of a meeting. So, like if I'm meeting you for the first time or we're having a good conversation, I'm trying to get as much information about you and your business as possible. But the way I always end it, Kayla is, okay, like Kayla, you, you, like you work with a lot of different businesses. Would you say there's one or two different industries or professions that you mesh well with? Like where do a majority of your leads come from? Do they come from do they come from, you know, handymen, plumbers? Do they come from contractors or you, you name it, right? And normally what will happen is you'll start saying, oh, yeah, well, I work with, you know, I tend to get a lot of referrals from attorneys. I tend to get a lot of referrals from bankers. I tend to get a lot of referrals from fill in the blank, right? That's when I start tapping into my database because I've got this whole database of people that I've known. I'm a Colorado local. I've lived here 37 years. I know a lot of people here in all different industries. I'm a part of a couple different chamber of commerces. So depending on what area you are and like what need you have, I probably know somebody pretty well that I can refer you to. So then while I'm sitting with them right there at the meeting, I, I, I kind of just say, you know, Kayla, tell you what, I've got a few people in all of these industries. Why don't I send out an email and connect us all and let's all go grab lunch and see if we can all do some business together. That one question alone has landed me more business than any other question. Because immediately after I do that, they feel so overwhelmed with gratitude that their next question is, well, shoot, like, who do you work well with? Oh, thanks for asking. I work really well with financial advisors. I would love any attorneys you have, whether that be family law, probate, estate planning, anybody you know in those areas, I would love an introduction to. And then I get them to do the exact same thing. 
So rather than trying to cold call an attorney's office and get in front of them, I now have a warm referral from somebody that they know, they like, they trust, and it's just easier to get on their books. And then from there, you cultivate the relationship by just being, just being a guy, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, that's, yeah. that's great advice. Um, just the ultimate connector. I think the introvert in me is like, oh my God, I could never do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could never go and do that um, because I am such an introvert. But it's cool to like, you know, hear you talk about that strategy and how it's been so impactful for your business. I love it. Um, so I want to know a little bit about your podcasts because you, yeah. I believe you have Bros Who Bible, I which do. I want to hear yeah. about that. And I believe you have another podcast as well. So I want to talk about your content creation journey and then okay. uh, talk about your podcasts as well. Sure. Yeah. So I've got two podcasts. One is called From the Ground Up. And we just celebrated a year in business with From the Ground Congrats. Up. And that's, thank you. Thank you. And that's, um, I've got a couple business partners that I run that with, Shay Jenkins and Sarah Alberts. They're my two mortgage gals over at s and Mortgage. And initially, we started that as a way to get in front of real estate agents. At, th at that point, I was pretty heavily in, into building my team. So we thought, you know, what better way to get, you know, some business for them, have them meet some new agents, get me some at-bats in front of some new agents and potentially talk to them about maybe maybe a new home over at Real Brokerage or on, or on my team and learn all about their business. I mean, selfishly, I love to learn from people who are crushing it at a high level because... I can get to where I want to go in half the time if I follow people who have done it already, right? Like if you're doing something that I want to be doing at the level that I want to be doing it, I'd be a fool not to listen to you and not to ask questions to you. So we created a platform for what it, what it started out being was agents and how they built their business. We, we found out um, after having a couple non-agents on the show that we got a lot of traction and just a completely different perspective on business but still applying it to the real estate industry when we started bringing people on who are outside of the real estate industry. So we've expanded. I mean, we've had plastic surgeons on the show. We've had a psychic medium who came in, and that was really fun. If you want to hear me get a, a psychic medium reading, you can go check out that episode. I recently had an EMDR therapist on the show, and it's somebody who I've worked with to get through a lot of things that I've gone through in my life. I'm a, I'm a recovering alcoholic and drug addict of about seven years. And she was able to help me get to the root issues of why that was not just, you know, I was, I had been clean for six years before I went to her, but she helped me get to the root cause and I'm healing from that. And, and that's just been a substantial change in my life. And actually part of the journey that helped me realize that my ego was interjecting into most areas of my life and really just see things from a different perspective. So we've become a very well-rounded podcast, but what you can expect from that is really entertaining we don't take things too serious. Like I kind of use it as a way to touch up my stand up comedy. I like to think that I'm a comedian. So <laughs> witty jokes and comebacks are the norm. Um, so it's really easy going, really fun, really entertaining, but we get to the bottom and, and really the ground level of people's businesses and what makes them successful. We go over stories of times they've failed. What have they learned? Um, book recommendations. Like we go through a lot with them and really take our, our listeners on a journey that they can apply to whatever industry they're in, but it tends to be more so for real estate agents. Hmm. So that's so that podcast. Yeah, go ahead. A couple, couple questions on that podcast um, yeah. it, that I, I'm kind of intrigued, right? Because you're bringing on people from your community and it sounds like a very a variety of individuals. And, but you mentioned that what you found is that real estate agents can actually take the principles that they're learning from these other business professionals and implement those into their business. And so I'm kind of like fascinated by that because I think so often on real estate podcasts, we do focus on the real estate professionals. And so I love that you're kind of like branching out into the community. And then also what I'm really curious to know is, has that served your business, right? Like, because you know, ultimately you're using your time to invest. I would imagine something is coming from that. Is that getting you business by bringing on these business professionals? So it's doing a couple of things. Um, 
Well, first off, I think business is business regarding, regardless of the industry you're in. Sales is going to be sales. Yeah, we might have a different vertical than other salespeople selling like tech software or, or whatever, or, or plastic surgery, right? We talked to this plastic surgeon. And he was talking about how he moved from here from New York, didn't know a single soul. And two years later, he's running one of the most successful practice surgery, plastic surgery practices in the state of Colorado. He's expanding. He's got multiple locations and he's kind of branded himself uh, here as a local celebrity. So we can all learn from that. And his approach was to go out to his community, help people understand like, hey, plastic surgery isn't what it was thought of years ago where we're just lifting and doing facial stuff like no this can be reconstructive this can help boost your confidence so he met people at the ground level educated 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 like crazy provided a ton of value and that's what ended up getting his word to spread and ultimately to the spot where he is now where he's expanding and that's something that we can do as real estate agents right i think i think we get so caught up in this thing that we have to be on social media so much like I, I've been producing a lot of social media content for like five or six years. Rarely do I get somebody who reaches out to me organically and says, Hey, Sean, I saw all your content and I want to work with you as an agent. But what it does is people will see once they get referred to me, they'll go back to my page and see that I'm proficient in real estate, right? So it's kind of acts as a website for me. But I think the biggest thing that it's helped me with is number one, it's helped my business because I've been able to take the gold nuggets from so many different top producers here in town. Like Denver is just flooded with top producing agents. I would say 80% of the transactions are done by the top 10% of agents over here. And we get a lot of them on our podcast. So candidly, I steal a bunch of their stuff and I apply it to my business and it works out really, really well. But also, you know, providing value to these outside business owners who might not be in the real estate industry, giving them content, providing them a platform where they can get their story out. That's helped me tremendously as far as getting ingrained in their spheres and getting, you know, into contact with people that they know, like, and trust. So it's, it's helped out in a ton of ways. Plus, I mean, I, I think probably the best thing is I seem like I'm really outgoing. Like I'm extroverted. I'm not like, if you put me in a room, like a networking event, I can go and I can talk to people, but inside my soul is dying and I'm cringing and I hate small talk. It's like the bane of my existence. But being on this podcast and getting in the habit of asking a lot of questions and asking in-depth questions, getting like really honing those skills where I can get people to open up about what they're passionate about has really helped me in the discovery phase of working with clients. Like I can get to the bottom of like the emotion behind buying or selling a house, the why they want to buy or sell. And that allows me to connect with them at a much deeper level than previous Sean that was just like sales, sales, sales. I don't really care about your end, like about the emotional side of it. Like, let's just get the result to happen. So I think it's helped me connect with people on a much deeper level. Hmm. Yes, yes, I love that. Um, a couple things come to mind. One is Simon Sinek talks about how we make our decisions based on emotion, and then we use logic, facts, and figures to justify the decision that we feel is right. Uh, and so I love that. And then also I had a mentor once tell me that your brilliance isn't demonstrated by what you tell someone. Your brilliance is demonstrated by the thought-provoking questions that you ask them. And so, yeah, no doubt that podcasts are such a great way to get in the habit of uncovering motivation and those sorts of things. So I love it. I'm a huge fan. I mean, clearly we've been doing our podcast for years, so I, I truly believe in them. And I think that there's this kind of misconception that the podcast space is so overwhelming. And, and I think that a lot of agents shy away from doing one because they feel like they don't have a lot of value to add. So you started another podcast as well. I did. So clearly you think that there is value to be added into the world. Tell us about your other podcast and why you started Bros Who Bible. Yeah. So this is like a, this is a passion project and this is something that, you know, I put my faith and trust in Jesus and he's been a real constant in my life, especially over the last three and a half years since my divorce. Um, I was a wreck and I didn't really know where to turn. My business was kind of failing at that point. I'd, play, I'd placed so much importance on my business and held it up here that when things started to crumble as a result of that, as a result of idolizing that business, 
I was kind of stuck. I didn't know where to go. And I really dove into my relationship with Jesus at that point, and it's been just night and day different. And, and the best thing that I can say about that, the best way I can describe it is <clears throat> it's not like my stresses or worries have gone away. Like, I'm still dealing with stuff. There's still circumstances in my life that aren't ideal. But I have this peace and this calm about it now that everything's under control because it's not in my control. So Bros Who Bible is a project that I started with my little brother. So my younger brother is a theologian. He's got a master's in theology from Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And he is the lead pastor of a church out here in Colorado called Deer Creek Church. And there a couple reasons why we started it. Number one, selfishly, I just love talking to my little brother. I love being with him. I learned so much talking with him. Like he gives me such a sound biblical perspective on things that are going on in my life that I wouldn't consider myself. Um, I'm kind of just, we, we kind of joke back and forth. Like he's the brains and I'm just kind of the average Christian guy that is learning all of this stuff. But I've also like burnt so many things to the ground in my life with just learning the hard way and doing things the wrong way and, you know, all the bumps and scrapes that come along with it. So I add a little bit of, uh, I think, comedic relief to the show where I talk about all the things that I've struggled with and, like, where I've fallen down. And he comes in and gives us really sound um, advice about it. But I think what, what, what we're really trying to achieve with that is especially men, right, and especially single men, and especially single men who are fathers um, who are really – out there working multiple jobs, trying to keep it together, struggling with their self-worth, struggling with their identity. Maybe they're dealing with addiction, right? There's so many of us that are out there dealing with addiction and just bad thoughts and they don't know where to turn. I think society has kind of created this shell of a man where it's not safe to open up. So our thought is if we can be really open and vulnerable about the stuff that we've gone through, where it's hurt us, where it's helped us, any learnings that we've seen, any different perspectives. Like I look at my, my divorce from a completely different perspective today than I did three years ago when I was going through it. Because Kayla, three years ago, it was my ex-wife's fault that we were getting divorced because she wouldn't mm. do this and she wouldn't do that and she didn't just support this. And how could she think this way when I'm out here busting my ass for all of that, right? But now it's like, no, okay, well, I can take accountability for my, for my actions in that. And if, if we can provide that kind of value to others that are out there who might be struggling with this and it helps them see things from a different perspective, maybe they don't have to go down the, the path that I went where everything was burnt to the ground, right? Maybe they can course correct. Maybe they can steer down a different path and find a better way. So that's really our hope with, with that podcast. Oh, I love that. And I love that you share your faith. I'm a believer as well. And I love that you share your, your faith and you're just very open about that. So thank you. Thank you for that. And, yeah. and you're God, also, and you know, for, so long, for so long, I wasn't willing to share that. I felt like, man, if I start talking about that, then people might not want to work with me. And now just because of this faith that I have, if somebody doesn't want to work with me because I have faith in Jesus, then I don't need to work with you. That's a great thing about being in business for this long is you can be kind of picky and choosy with who you want to work with. And that comes along with it. Yeah, absolutely. It's like if they don't want to work with you because of that, then maybe you didn't want to work with them either, right? And yeah, um, yeah it, it's, it's definitely working with others that are believers is a breath of fresh air. I have a client that I will pray with and it's just such a unique experience. Um, that's just like uniquely ours. So definitely love that, that you're sharing that. And then I also am, I love that, that you share that, Hey, I've had these struggles and you're really open about that because you're not alone and we all have our struggles. Um, but there is this kind of, I think, perception that we have to hide that away. We can't show the world that, you know, Hey, I'm real and, and I do have struggles. And so I'm curious, you know, you, you mentioned you're very open about your divorce. You're very open about your past, you know, drug addiction and alcoholism. What, what got you to the point where you were able to open up and talk about those things? Yeah. So I had kept, so when I got sober six and a half years ago, I kept it secret for a long time because I felt that same way. If, if anybody knew that I was a drug addict and an alcoholic and they wouldn't want to work with me, 
So I kept it a secret. And it got to a spot about two years into my sobriety where I started having these panic attacks. And I hadn't had panic attacks in years. But I started having these panic attacks, and I couldn't figure out why. And it's a God thing. I walked into a church service, and I was searching for a new church at this point. And I walk into a, a church here in town, and the pastor's up on stage talking about his anxiety and how he had a past. And his, his, his was like a pastor past, right? It wasn't quite as colorful as mine was. But he had some, <laughs> pastor you past. know, when, when he was like 18 <laughs> or 20, he had some issues. He was partying. He, you know, was with women and just in his pastor community, he felt like if, if any of the other folks in his community ever found out about that, they would kick him out and he wouldn't be able to be a pastor anymore. And he really feels called to be a pastor. So it was really conflicting for him. And it got to this point where he was so overwhelmed with anxiety that, you know, he, he went aside to one of the, the, the men in that group and just told him everything. And that man challenged him to tell everybody. So he did, and he went and told everybody, and what he received was overwhelming support, overwhelming grace, overwhelming love, which is what Jesus came to this earth to provide us, right? And he was talking about that on stage, and I was just, I have to meet this guy. So after, after service, I went and I tracked him down. I'm like, dude, we got to talk. Like, we have the same story. I'm having panic attacks right now. Like, I, I just, I need to talk to you. So the very next day he made time, I went and grabbed coffee with him and I just, I opened up to him about my sobriety and I opened up to him about all my, my fear of letting people see who I actually was. And he challenged me. He said, listen, we do these things called revive stories here where we take somebody who was struggling with something and we talk about how God has revived it through their life. And he goes, I, I want you to come tell that story. So it doesn't have to be today. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. It could be 10 years from now but I want that to be something that you work towards. He said, and I challenge you to go tell somebody about your story, somebody who you normally wouldn't, and just see how they react. So I took that as a challenge. I'm the kind of guy I'm like, okay, kind of like, hey, let's go see branch managers, right? Because I can see everybody instead of just one person. So I was like, you know what? At this point in my business, every month I was writing a hand, like a, a hand-typed newsletter that wasn't about business, but I was sending it to everybody in my database, and it was about something that was on my heart. So I would write stories about a charity that, that brings me joy or um, an interaction that I might have with somebody that, that touched me in a, in a certain way, right? Nothing about business, but like, hey, here's Sean the human, right? I went and wrote a two-page front and back. I even changed the font size to like eight to, to hit all of this. But I talked about my sobriety. I talked about where I was. I talked about how I got sober. I talked about life since then. I talked about all of the benefits and all the positives that I've experienced. But then I was really deep on all the negatives on all the stuff that I still don't have figured out. And I remember very distinctly, it was a Friday afternoon, I sent it over to my printing company who took care of all of the, the, the letters, the mail outs. And I sent it to them on Friday afternoon. I was like, hey, send this out to my whole database list. And they're like, cool, we got it. Everything's done, consider it done, right? Monday morning comes around, I wake up in just sheer panic. And I'm like, they better not what send that I out. <laughs> yeah. And normally <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a few day buffer zone. So I'm like, okay, well, there's no way they sent it out. So I immediately send her an email. I was like, hey, stop production. And she goes, oh, hey, Sean, we actually sent everything out about an hour ago. So I just like my heart drops. I'm like, okay, this is where it ends. I'm going to have to go back to credit repair. My real estate career is over. Everybody's going to know I'm, I'm figured out, right? But something amazing happened over the next like 72 hours as it started hitting people's mailbox. My phone started blowing up and not one of them was anybody judging me. It was all, oh my goodness, I had no idea. Thank you so much for sharing. My husband's going through the same thing. Hey, would you go and meet with my high school kid who's, you know, kind of veering off the wrong path? It ended up turning into something where I was able to touch a lot of lives and help a lot of people. Some groups sparked out of that where I was meeting with men regularly. Um, and I think it just really helped me get really comfortable sharing that part of my story. And as a result, it opened up so many different doors for me. And now I've found that the more open I am about that part of my life, the more it gives people a chance to connect and say like, hey, me too. I think if you provide an open platform for somebody, 
it can really give them an opportunity to get something out that they've held in for a really long time. And that can be very freeing for them, but also really rewarding for me at the same time. What a cool story. I love that you call them and you're like, stop it. Don't put it out there. Don't do it. And then they're like, sorry, dude, it's done. <laughs> yeah. No, that was God I'm, doing it. God's like, no, man, it's out. Yeah. People need to hear this. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's so true. I, okay. So do you think that being in real estate, you mentioned earlier in the podcast that you were easily triggered, you know, all these things, which I can totally relate to, right? Like I can totally relate to the ridiculousness of being easily triggered and all of that um, from deals. And mm -hmm. do you think that the real estate industry can kind of like chew you up, spit you out and make you more prone to using substances. I mean, you know, we go to, you go to real estate events and it's all about the booze and it's all about getting drunk and all these things. Like, is our industry kind of systemically unhealthy? I think it can be. I think the industry itself, it, there's a lot of things that I battle with it and I've had to come to, I've really had to be very intentional about the way I handle my business, especially over the last year. Um, just as I've, I've become more attuned to what's going on. Number one, I think the business, um, it's one of those business where it really, it's a very egotistical and self gratifying business, right? There's a lot of self promotion and it kind of hit me one day. I've got a box of them sitting over here, but I was, I, I was sending out, notepads to all of my past clients with my face on it. And it's like a, a grocery list. And I'm like, let's put a magnet on the back of it so I can be on the refrigerator. And when they need new, like when they need grapes, they're going to write grapes on my face. And when they're at the grocery store, hopefully they'll remember me. Right. I'm just like, I, I just felt cringy about to send those out. I sent them out anyway. So if I'm on your fridge, there you go. Um, but I felt really cringy sending that out. And then I start looking at all of the content that real estate agents are creating. And a lot of it's really good and I'm not knocking anybody, but for me, it just seems very self-promoting, very, very almost egotistical. And it's, it's like we, we promote this side of us that isn't necessarily true. We promote like the goods, the highs, like here's my transaction count. Here's my volume. But I think we lose touch of like the families that we're helping in a lot of ways. So that was something that, that I've really had to, to really cater my business to, to try and not do that. And it's even more so difficult having the podcast because we are talking with a lot of people and they do want to talk about the success of their business, which I think they should. And I also fight with like, hey, you know, God gave me a talent and it's, it's like I'm, I'm pretty good at this real estate sales thing. And if I can really help a lot of people with it, it would be selfish for me not to. So there's a lot of conflicting thoughts going through my head. But I will say when I initially got sober, <clears throat> I was one year into the business. In my first office I was at, we were a very tight group. Right next door was the Jefferson Park Pub. And it was a culture where people would come in and like, man, I just closed this awesome deal. Let's go over to the pub and grab some beers, right? Or it was, ah, oh, God, I have this deal that's like my sellers are driving me crazy and they, they just can't come to their senses. Let's go over to the pub and grab a beer, right? And it was just so much of the business was predicated around that. And then my business model at the time was let's just hold as many happy hours as networking events as possible where there's drinking and then eventually turns to drug use. And just, I do think it's a slippery slope in the way that the business is set up. It's very easy to go down that road. And actually I talked to a lot of people who candidly come up to me and say, man, I really like, I can't do it anymore. I don't want to go out and I don't want to drink, but every event that I go to, there's drinks and there's this and there's that. Like, how do you do it? And I think that's just being really grounded in yourself and having the confidence in yourself that you don't have to do that. Like me, Sean, like my identity isn't through drinking. It's not through partying. My identity isn't through real estate sales. My identity isn't given to me through, through any of those things, right? It's because it's me. I hold value. And either you want to be around me or you don't, whether I have a drink in my hand or not. I think it's just getting really comfortable and confident with that and just portraying that in a way that's like, hey, I'm not judging you if you're drinking, but it's just not for me. I got stuff to do tomorrow. You know, I got I got kids. I got to get up early. I can't be drinking. <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, Sean, as we wrap up today, I have a couple a couple uh, rapid fire questions for you. All so, right. all right, what is underrated in real estate right now? I think what's underrated in real estate. Well, all right, I I, I will say the the value of a good listing agent. I think is underrated because I think for so long it was so easy to just throw a sign in the yard and get the house sold. But a really good listing agent is going to help walk through the house and create a checklist of different items that the seller can do. They don't necessarily have to cost a lot of money or time, but just little tweaks that can provide a, a better value to the sellers that are going to sell the property for, for higher and net them more money. So I think just being really knowledgeable in those types of quick ROI grabs in properties I think is really downplayed. Mm, I love how you put that ROI graphs. I love it. I'm going to steal that one. Okay. On the flip side, what is overrated in real estate right now? I think what's overrated. I think the, well, that's a great question. Wow. What is overrated? I think there's a lot that's overrated. I think, um, I think a lot of the marketing that agents say that they're putting out, that's going to do all of this different, you know, magical stuff for, for sellers. I think a lot of it is really self-promotion. So the listing videos, the walkthrough videos, yes, there is a market that are going to see that and, and maybe, you know, turn into a potential buyer for a property. But most of that is really used to promote the agent and their brand and their, their thing, which isn't necessarily bad. It helps you get more business. But I think from a consumer standpoint, it's not as valuable as you think. Oh, that's going to be a good short. We're going to have listing agents across the country sharing it. People are going to be firing that there's... up on me. Yeah. <laughs> no, they're going to be thankful. They're going to be yeah. like, yeah, this, see, see, this guy said it's all, it's all overrated. That one's going to be the agent who does open houses, right? They're, they're there to get buyers. We know what you're doing. Yeah. I feel you. Yeah, exactly. But then, you know, you, you're setting these up. expectations. Yeah. <laughs> I, I appreciate the hustle too, but. It sets unrealistic expectations for the seller. That's for sure. Okay. Okay. So what is your favorite quote? Oh, I can't necessarily quote it, but I will say the most impactful thing that I've heard recently comes from Tim Tebow. And he was talking about winning the Heisman and then immediately going on a mission trip. And he went on a mission trip to Thailand and he, he saw a, a young boy who was wearing a Tim Tebow jersey that had been passed on hundreds and hundreds of times it was muddy it was gross it was there were holes in it the kid didn't know that tim tebow was standing right in front of him but at that point he looked at his life and said okay well what is what, what's actually significant here is it all the awards and accolades the heisman trophy or is it that i'm here helping this 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 little child get clean drinking water and i think even though it's not a quote just that alone has completely shifted my mindset on so many things. In fact, in my office, I'm staring at a poster of Tim Tebow with a definition of significance over it. So I would say that that would be the most impactful quote slash thing that I've heard. Love it. Very heartwarming. All right. And leave us with your favorite book. Favorite book. Gosh. Well, it's got to be the Bible. I think the Bible in so many different ways, I don't care what you're going through, what storm you're going through, if you open that up and you read it and you apply it to your life, it's going to speak to you in a way that's very relevant to what you're going through today. Um, every single morning I read through the book of Proverbs and I read through the Gospels amongst a few other books that I, that I have. Um, but whatever I'm going through, whatever I'm struggling with, the Bible always just has a very unique way of talking to me specifically for me. And I will read passages that I've read hundreds of times, but it's just going to hit different because of what I'm going through and what the Holy Spirit is interpreting in me. So hands down, it's got to be the Bible. I love it. I love it. Um, so fun fact, when I was younger, my parents would wake all of us kids up in about 530 in the morning as my stepdad would have to go off to work soon thereafter. And we would be forced, I say forced because I was not happy about this so early in the morning, to read through a proverb and five psalms. And we would do that every month and circulate through them. And there are so many good nuggets. You're absolutely right. I love the proverbs. Great words so of many. wisdom. There. Aren't you so, thankful now yeah. for it? I, like I'm so thankful then, now. Yeah, heck yeah. yeah. And they'll, yeah. they'll come to me, you know. Be... And it's going to be so different too. Next time you read them, it's amazing. 
So true. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today and being open and authentic with us and our listeners. We appreciate you and uh, thank you so much. Hey, thank you for, for having me. I feel really blessed and honored to be here and happy to, uh, happy to talk to everybody. So I really appreciate the platform. Thanks, Kayla. Awesome. Hey, Sean, how can our listeners reach out to you? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram. My handle is at real underscore Neelan underscore Sean. Probably the best way to get at me. Awesome. All right, Sean. Thanks again.